Welcome back to the weekly news roundup. My deepest apologies that we could not do the show live. Apparently, the single Verizon tower feeding this desert here is either having some technical difficulties or something else funky is going on here because we're getting all sorts of weird uh, back and forth stuff that I've never gotten in this place. I've spent a lot of time where I'm at right now. So hopefully that is resolved within a day or two because I'd really like to not move for the next few weeks. And I do kind of need good internet. So let's go ahead and get on into the news today. So, of course, these are usually recorded live Fridays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when, of course, we have Internet to do it. But we're going to go ahead and uh, jump on into the news. First up, we've talked about this in the past where... Uh, Meta in the EU, Meta was forced, they, they said, hey, you have to have a way to not track people. And so they come down and say, fine, uh, and then it's going to cost you money, so you end up paying you know, a bunch of dollars. So in this case, roughly $275 a year, that way you can still use Meta products and you're not getting ads targeted to you and they're not collecting, I guess they're probably collecting the data. They're probably just not running the ads on you, as I've said in the previous video about this. But in my personal opinion, like now they're being sued for forcing users to pay to stop the tracking. And I I have to, I, hell is freezing over. I have to agree with Meta on this one. Okay. I really have to agree with Meta on this one. It's like, we released a product, it doesn't cost anything, but we make our money by selling ads. I completely disagree with that entire model. Ergo, I don't have a Facebook page and I'm not going to get one. I'm not going to use Facebook. Screw Facebook. Okay. Very simple thing. If you do not want Facebook tracking you, don't use their service. All right. So, now the EU comes down and says, well, you have to give people a way to not be tracked. They say, fine, give us some money. So they implement this, and now they're getting sued for asking for money to not track people. What type of idiocy are we living in? This is nonsense. It's like, okay, they provided a service that didn't cost you anything out of your own pocket. Advertisers were subsidizing it. You say, well, you can't do that anymore. So they come up with a way that the advertisers aren't subsidizing it. Now you're subsidizing it. And I say, how dare you charge us money to not get tracked? I'm sorry. I have no choice but to agree with Meta on this one. If you don't want to get tracked, don't use their service, period. And if you want to have an experience where you're not seeing the ads and you want to pay for it, pay for it. But don't sit here and be like, they, they're they collecting data. Okay, well, here's a way to not collect data. You're going to pay for it. But now I don't want to pay for it. So you want everything, but you don't even want to pay for it. It's like, th that is a bunch of nonsense. So uh, I have to agree with Meta on this one here. This is a bunch of nonsense. Um, it, because it's like they said, you got to have a way that n people aren't getting all these targeted ads. Fine, it's going to cost you money. But now they don't. Yeah. Oh, well, the world is full of idiots. What can we say? Um, of course, I'm not with Meta on this one. Um, Meta designed the platforms to get children addicted, according to court documents. This is what their court documents are alleging. All right. So, of course, they're like, someone think of the children. Facebook did. Oh, we thought of the children. We thought about how we can addict them to our platform. So the, what happened here is a whistleblower in the company uh, told, uh, basically said, Hey, we have a lot of the, a lot of minors that we know are minors. We're just not doing anything about. And we have a lot of other information coming through the pipeline that is from people who, uh, we had a number of things. Number one, people that we know are not minors. Number two, we had a lot of executives talking about how we can exploit minors for their their psychology in order to addict them to the platform. And then you had cases of parents saying, hey, my kid is on here and that my kid should not be on here. Get them off the platform. And they're not doing anything about that, which was kind of hilarious. In fact, that's this one here. One example, lawsuit cites an internal email thread in which employees discuss why a 12-year-old girl's four accounts were not deleted following complaints from the girl's mother stating her daughter was 12 years old and requesting the accounts be taken down. The employees concluded that the accounts were ignored in part because representatives of Meta couldn't tell for sure the user was underage. 
So here you have the parent of a minor child, whether the person is 12 or 13, makes a difference. They're like sitting there going, I wonder if this girl's under 13, <laughs> you know, and that's what Facebook was doing. And despite the parent saying, I don't want my minor child on here. So if the parent says no, the answer should be no, regardless of whether or not the child by their own merit, a 13-year-old should be allowed on the platform or not is not even the question because the question boiling down happens to be this one. At what point in time does the parent step in and say no? Because that's exactly what should be happening. The parents should be that final arbiter. And when the parent of a minor child comes in and approaches Facebook and says, you got to take this my kid's stuff down. Well, what if they're 17? Yeah, what if they are 17? That's still a minor and that is still the person responsible for them. We, we can't be having these conversations like this. All right. But further on down the article, as the guys at Meta said, they're talking about the, the problems with this. Uh, uh, let's see. The presentation discussed the teen's brain's relative immaturity. Teenagers tend to be driven by emotion and intrigue of novelty and reward and asked about how these characteristics could manifest in product usage. That's exciting. Uh, of course, they're fighting back against any age restriction saying, saying, you know, we, we really need, we really need, need the, the, big tech companies and and the parents to all get involved in all this. The problem is you have a mother of a 12-year-old saying, my daughter has four accounts they need to come down. And Facebook's like, ah, oh, we can't tell if the person's under 13. It shouldn't matter. The mother has spoken up. So um, th this is just crazy. And yeah, this is one that'll cause more problems. And on to our feature story here in Privacy News. Amazon wants you to ditch your key cards and scan your palms to get into the office. I don't know. Would you rather Would you rather have an implanted microchip or a palm scan to get into work? You have to have one or the other. Hmm. We're really approaching the mark of the beast stuff here. Scan your hand. Which one? Your right hand, of course. Hmm. I don't have a right hand here. We'll just embed this chip in your forehead. Just put your forehead down near this little reader. Dink. You know, access granted, Dave. So uh, what they're trying to do, though, is Amazon has one enterprise. So, of course, the big problem with this is now you have a big corporate trying to propose a solution for some company. And being as it's Amazon, it'll probably be a somewhat cheaper solution. And so now all of these companies are going to come by and be like, oh, this is awesome. So now we'll just scan everybody's fingerprints into here. Now, allegedly, the way the technology is supposed to work, supposed to, is everything is done on like a local thing. There's a local key. The palm gets scanned in and the this creates a uh, hash and then the hashes uh, are put into the system and then all the security for the company has to do is delete the hash from the system and that will immediately block you out from accessing uh, anything that you were using. The problem is this is an Amazon AWS system. We know that everything Amazon AWS does some form of cloud syncing stuff. And so is this really safe? I'm going to argue probably not. Now they're sitting here like, well, this is better than better than an, a pin number or a ID card or all this kind of stuff. You just scan your palm. No, thank you. I am not going to scan my palm into a system. Fortunately, some nations have Rules against biometrics. Illinois and United States have strong anti-biometric laws. So I don't think this would fly over there, at least not without Amazon cozying up to whatever the, the governor of that state is and be like, hey, we'll uh, give you more stuff to allow this over here. Yeah, sure. So, uh, But the idea here is that Amazon wants to create a biometric scan of your of your palm print and they say this is more accurate than other forms of biometrics because it does the palm the prints and the vein structure and all this is a much more complicated finger yeah like a fingerprint quote-unquote fingerprint of uh the data i have a sneaky suspicion that's not the case <laughs> this is terrifying and uh i'd rather not participate thank you let me know if you would participate in the comments down below and i'm not going to participate in giving them my email address either <laughs> there's an exercise in futility all right, well, if you want to help support the channel, we do use affiliates. Today we are highlighting Pro Writing Aid. Pro Writing Aid is an excellent tool that you can use for doing advanced grammar, spell checking, and other things like that. There are plugins for uh, LibreOffice, assuming you're using that evil platform called Windows. Sadly, I don't think they work on Linux at this point in time. I just use the web version anyway. 
Uh, that's what I use. I use a uh, um, language tool inside LibreOffice, and then I use this as a standalone web browser. You can use my affiliate code there, tlm.li forward slash PWA, and that is going to give you 20% off the premium or the premium pro plans uh, on the yearly uh, or the lifetime options. And uh, the monthly ones, uh, there's no discount on it, but uh, that will still help. Uh, help the the channel out. So we do uh, benefit from you uh, using this code here, tlm.li forward slash PWA, if you need a good grammar checking tool that is not Grammarly, which has been known to store your stuff and use it for their own purposes in the past. Pro Writing Aid has never had that inside of their privacy policy. All right, so next up, we will jump on over to security, looking at a couple of security news items. And uh, having a look over at security, first up, the Docker Hub could be containing thousands of valuable secrets, and they're all in plain view. This is one of many reasons I don't like Docker. Of course, this isn't having this isn't a criticism of Docker quite as much as the developers using it. But as you develop these platforms that are super easy to develop for, and then nothing is really audited, it just kind of goes into the Dockerverse. What ends up happening is all sorts of weird stuff starts showing up. In this case, they said there's thousands of secret keys, private keys, and all sorts of other stuff that really shouldn't be on the Internet, but they're widely available. So they uh, this team analyzed 10,178 Docker images. They found almost 5,000, 54% holding secrets that could be deemed uh, sensitive information. From the 5,000 container images, they pulled 19. Uh, 191,529 secrets. Many were duplicates, which when removed, they were left with 48,481 secrets. And this is how Kia cars get hacked so easily. <laughs> uh, billions of downloads. Of course, these, uh, these tokens are used all over the place. Most common secret tokens were GitHub tokens. 26%, 26.6% of all secret tokens were GitHub. Doesn't that terrify you? Then there's uh, Datadog tokens, there's uniform resource identifiers, and a bunch of other private keys used for encrypting or decrypting were also discovered. So all this type of stuff that you do not want to. They found 9,000 PayPal OAuth secrets. Oh, isn't that exciting? Um, they found 8,000 unifying ID secrets used to expose identity data. So uh, basically, Docker is a wild west of non-regulated uh, secret keys and uh, other stuff. It's kind of like, you know, you go into your favorite video game, and you got your, your, like, your treasure hunting, you know, you're going into the beating the boss over and over to get all the, the stuff. Or is that like treasure mining, I think? You know, it's kind of like you can go treasure mining in Docker for all sorts of fun secret codes. <laughs> Do all sorts of neat stuff. So uh, be warned, particularly if you're a Docker developer, please clean your codes out of there. Malicious links are dominating emails all over the world. I wanted to include this one because I get so many of these. I'm just, I am so curious about them that I am just like, you know what? I want to go click all these. I think I'm going to set up a cubes instance and click them all and see where they go. Um, I, I, this came to me right on the heels of one of my clients uh, that uh, I do some Facebook management for them. Uh, sends me an email. Now, it was funny because we had just pushed out an, an ad and then we got a, a policy violation email. I'm like, ah, that sucks. Because our the business is somewhat tangentially related to the medical field, although not entirely. I'm pretty careful to make sure that we don't do anything that might run afoul of their ever-changing landscape of whack-a-mole. But uh, nevertheless, we get this. I'm like, oh boy. And I look at it closely and uh, the email address where it came from was a long string of characters at something that was not Meta or Facebook or anything like that. So I emailed him back right away. I'm like, yeah, this looks like a scam. Don't click anything in there. And of course, it was linking to a Facebook page, which I really want to click that Facebook page. We got another one within 24 hours. And uh, that one was a, from a different email address linking to a different Facebook page. And then, uh, so I log into Facebook to see if there's any legitimacy to this. And our whole messenger inbox is full of 15 more. Actually, I was a legit, you know, okay, I'm, I'm multiplying by five. It was, I think, three or four. I can't remember exactly. Uh, three or four more of these things on Facebook Messenger with like bit.ly link type things. 
uh, that are like verify your identity here to run your ad. Like, huh? So I'm not super well versed with Facebook, but boy, I can smell a scam. So I go over to the ads page and I see our ad is running and spending money and generating clicks. And I'm just thinking, yeah. So uh, Facebook uh, was taking our money, serving it on uh, um, on malicious networks, and now the scammers know that we might have those. Fortunately, I'm the one in control of things over there, so uh, I am going to collect all of those links, and uh, I'm going to do a video showing you where they go on tour on Cubes. It'll be fun. Um, stay tuned for that one. Uh, I was hoping to get data for that today, but it didn't happen. Today's been crazy. But anyway. Anyway, malicious links are dominating emails. I get hundreds of these. I can, I, I could, I could probably spend an hour or two just clicking links on the emails I get daily about this kind of crap. But it's happening. They're impersonating major brands. This is this is a, a good one for me because, like, I'll get them from like Apple. I'll get them from Facebook. I'll get them from Microsoft. I get them from cPanel, um, and it's quite hilarious because it's like, um, yeah, I don't have any of these accounts, you know. So, I mean, I, I know Apple, my Apple account's not getting breached because I don't have one. Um, and my cPanel account, well, I know that, like, the most common one to get with the cPanel branding is, like, your mailbox is almost full. Click here. Uh, my mailbox is controlled on my own server. I built this thing from ground up. I know my mailbox is not full. Thank you. Um, investigate further. Of course, it's scammers. But what they found, DHL takes up 26.1%. I can confirm. I get a lot of DHL ones. Um, and then we have um, Amazon. We have FedEx, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Netflix. I do not know if I've gotten... No, I have gotten an Amazon one. I know I do get a lot of DHL. I've gotten an Amazon. I've gotten some FedExes. Usually the DHL and the FedExes are like, your package was delivered. Here's your link or something. Um, I have gotten LinkedIn. I have gotten Microsoft. I do not recall if I've actually personally gotten any Netflix ones, but you know, we'll see. <clears throat> so, uh, just be aware malicious links are dominating emails all over the world. All right. And there is a vulnerability in own cloud. Of course, next cloud is forked out of own cloud. And that raises the first question. What is my next cloud account secure? The next cloud account is indeed secure. There were three critical security flaws inside of own cloud. When exploited, they could reveal sensitive information, modify files. One of them could lead to the disclosure of sensitive credentials. In other words, your admin credentials could be leaked with this one. Now, why this happened is that own cloud was using open source libraries, just like, you know, Kia and uh, uh, a, a few of these other car companies are getting sued out of oblivion for making things with like random <laughs> stack overflow sample code in them. Well, own cloud apparently was doing the same thing. So of course, everybody asked over there on next cloud is next cloud and um, uh, subject to this. And they said, no, the reason is all of these flaws come from uh, supply chain issues where own cloud just copy and pasted from things. Whereas next cloud goes through and really verifies there's nothing in any of those. So next cloud, as far as we know, and as far as they say, is not susceptible to these vulnerabilities. But if you're using own cloud, you should probably think to migrate to next cloud anyway. It is a lot more uh, developed and it is a lot more um, uh, onto the security stuff. Well, if you want to help support the channel, we do have a shop. Uh, so you can go ahead on over to shop.switch2linux.com. Oh, order now for delivery by Christmas. I mean, just imagine your, your baby's eyes when they open up their present and find a, an alien in a tinfoil hat, baby onesie, bodysuit. Come on, guys. Isn't that totally epic? Of course, we have hats like the one I'm wearing here, and we have coffee cups and mouse pads and all sorts of other fun stuff, uh, hoodies, stuff like that. So uh, you can have a look over at shop.switch2linux.com com for all of your merch needs and with that let's head on over to ai overlords let's see what our ai overlords are doing today well OpenAI has this new custom chatbot system 
uh, that you, where you can create your own chat bot based on uh, chat GPT. And then you go in there and you can specify certain things and unleash it in the world as this is my, this is my, what's the best Linux distribution AI. And people will ask it questions and it'll tell you what the best distribution is. And if I had one of these, it would certainly be programmed to be nothing like everything's Gen 2 and nothing is Ubuntu. Come on guys. We got to make the world fun. No, we wouldn't do that. I mean, kicking out Ubuntu for sure, but I wouldn't kick anybody to Gentoo unless uh, one of the questions is, are you a sadomasochist? If you answer yes, it's Gentoo, of course. So, um, but all of these uh, new custom chat GPTs that you can make, they are apparently very good and very loose-lipped at leaking out uh, the commands that you're testing them with and the other information that's available, basically all of the fun stuff that uh, is out there available to do. Uh, these guys, uh, you know, they're all leaking all over the place. So if you're using one of these customized chat GPTs, uh, just be aware anything and everything you put in there uh, will be used against you in the, uh, the court of big tech AI. So just be aware of that. Uh, that's kind of crazy. Now, our last story here is, will ChatGPT write ransomware? The answer is a resounding yes. Now, this is actually the same article author did try this again last year with ChatGPT3 and found that the limitations in ChatGPT, he described ChatGPT3 as kind of like working with a teenager. Um, it could do a decent job, but then after a while it gets bored and starts staring out the window and then loses focus of what it's doing. He said that's what happened with ChatGPT. T3. So even though they put in quote unquote alleged safeguards, it's going to prevent you from using it to write malware of various forms. He said it was extraordinarily easy to get around that. And the only limitation, the only reason he was not able to use chat GPT three to get good ransomware code was simply because this system didn't have enough memory points to hold it all together. So now release chat GPT four and he goes into there and chat GPT four is like, I don't have any safeguards. What do you want to do? Oh, you want to go into somebody's computer, encrypt all the files, delete everything that remains, and leave a nasty message? Sure. Let me show you exactly how to do that. So, yeah, ChatGPT3 was bad enough on the world. If you thought that that was unleashing nonsense on the world, wait until ChatGPT4 gets here. Now, I did just write an article on uh, AI and uh, some of the fundamental problems with it. It'll be uh, used for tinfoil hat time here sometime in the upcoming future. One of the things I found in there is, of course, there's a lot of people talk about how negative ChatGPT is. And, of course, I found this article on Medium that was, we got to focus on the positives instead. There's a fundamental problem with focusing on the positives. The reason focusing on the positives is a problem is simply and exclusively because as the human race, we tend not to focus on the positives because in my Christian opinion, you can look at my channel, Our Walk in Christ, on wherever platform you're watching this, what we understand is that we are inherently sinners. So even though we might release something like ChatGPT with the best intentions of mankind, mankind will always use it and turn it towards its own evil ends, which is why one preacher once said, improved technology gives us an improved means to reach our own deteriorating ends. We are not going to solve the world's problems with ChatGPT. We are just going to make them worse. <laughs> Okay, and this is an example of that. We now have good, solid ransomware thanks to ChatGPT 4.0, and uh, he goes through everything that's going on. He talks about the safeguards removed, uh, the the programming tutor. Should we be worried? Uh, in a word, yes. <laughs> Eight months ago, he says, I concluded, well, I don't think we're going to see ChatGPT written ransomware anytime soon. I said that for two reasons. There are easy ways to get ransomware than to ask ChatGPT to write it. And two, because its code has so many holes and problems, only a skilled programmer would be able to deal with it. ChatGPT, however, has improved so much in eight months that only one of those things is still true. ChatGPT 4.0 is so good at writing and troubleshooting code, it could reasonably be used by a non-programmer. And because it didn't raise a single objection to anything I asked it to do, even when I asked it to write code to drop ransom notes, it's as useful to an evil non-programmer as it is to a benign one. That means it can lower the bar for entry into cybercrime. And this is what the fundamental problem is, because 
we can release something like this to try and solve the world's problems, but the reality is it will only get be used to deepen the world's problems instead. You know, you think about this, you know, what if AI is used to improve the food chain so we can improve my guys, you understand? I mean, that is that is clearly a talking point from an idiot. Okay, you do realize that the farmers across America are forced to dump out millions and millions and millions of gallons of milk to keep the milk prices static. They are forced to do so by the government. It would be illegal for them to sell more milk than the government tells them should be available to have. But if instead they sold all that milk or gave that milk to the poor or gave that milk to the school districts instead of, you know, giving the tax dollars to the schools so that they can buy the milk at the inflated price from the big corporation. What if instead the local farmers gave all that milk to the schools? The school now has milk for everybody without having to spend taxpayer dollars for it. Well, the problem is we're just getting way too close to the resources on this one. We have more food in this world than we could possibly need to feed it to. The problem is the people who have all of that food want money for it, and that's where the problem is. There's economic issues. Now, I'm not suggesting a form of communist utopia. I don't think that that's going to fundamentally work either. But we need a lot more than a computer program coming by and pretending that that's actually going to solve all of our problems because the reality is it is a not. And so when I see these AI is going to solve the world's problems, no, it's not. AI is going to make the world much worse. And the sooner we realize that, the better off we are going to be as a society. Well, if you want to help out my economic situation, I do have a Patreon page. You can jump on over to Patreon. Uh, patreon.com slash T-O-M-M. This will support all of my different channels. Of course, the biggest thing we're doing over there right now is once a month, we will get a good new science fiction short story related to modern technologies, policies, or other things that I find fascinating in the world. So our latest one was just released. Tied, uh, of course, I spent, you know, what, two months in California, so it's definitely tied into some of the things in California. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was a, a fun little article out there that I wrote. Uh, definitely have a look. If you're already a supporter on any one of our platforms and you have not got a chance to read that or listen to the audiobook version, go ahead and head on over there and read that or download the audio files. If you are interested in that and you are not yet a um, a supporter, you can jump on over to patreon.com slash T-O-M-M and help support the channel there. With that, let's head on over to business news, see what's up in the wide world of corporatocracy. We only have a couple of articles over here. Still a slow news week right after Thanksgiving. Google to pay Canada news publishers $73 million a year to keep news in search. So in my opinion, Google cucked to Canada's crazy, stupid rule. This is another thing I agree with Meta on. Meta so far is like, no. Canada's like, you have to pay or you can't link us anymore. Facebook says, all right, bye, and just stops linking the news. Of course, this fundamentally hurt the news, and then the Canadian government comes back, Facebook, half of our country's on fire with wildfires. Do you think you can put those links back on? They're like, nope. Change your law. <laughs> Some of the stuff Matt is doing right now makes me want to get a Facebook account. Come on, guys. Maybe Instagram, I don't know, but no, and then, then, then cooler heads prevail and I remember all of the nonsense that they do and the fact that they, you know, yeah, never mind. But Google does cuck. They're going to pay $73 million a year, which is approximately $100, $100 million in Canadian dollars for uh, distribution to the publishing companies in order to keep news links on Google. The, see, the news company should be paying Google because without them... Without the the news articles being on Google, nobody is going to go over there. Nobody's going over to Google being like, wow, you know. Um, but that the it, this is completely crazy and backwards. But in my opinion, I think Google has cucked on this. They should have taken the solid stance with Meta um, and then, you know, find one more big tech company to do the same thing. And uh, then nobody can get any uh, Canadian propaganda in any of their feeds. And then the propaganda collapses and the Canadian goes, what's going on? Why aren't we getting any revenue? Um, come on guys. This is, this is like the EU telling meta, Hey, you have to have a, you have to have a way for people not to have data. Okay. Here, you just got to pay for it. No, no, no. You can't charge people for that. Like, <laughs> 
But Google has cocked. They're paying $100 million. Now they're play, paying it to one centralized uh, agency, which is going to distribute the money to the various Canadian news groups. I have a sneaky suspicion that the Rebel News Media, which is a media group up there, still subject to a lot. I have a sneaky suspicion they're not going to see any of those. Uh, but let me know if I'm wrong about that. Somebody who's going to follow this closer than I am. Um, I imagine most of it's going to go to CBC, uh, CBC, which is, you know, funded by the Canadian government anyway. Why they need $100 million of Google's money is beyond me. Uh, but, you know, that's how the bill works because they just write these things to enrich themselves. So, yeah. So following extensive discussions, we're pleased the government of Canada has committed to addressing our core issues with Bill C-18, Kent Walker says. Eh, I think they cocked. Uh, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Um, I think Meta's stance is way better. All right, you don't want us to do stuff? All right, fine. We won't. Come on, please. We have to allow the, the news out there because people are on Facebook and we need them to see the news. Nope. Oh. I had to... Hell is truly freezing over. I have I have praised Meta twice in this one news article so far. This is crazy, guys. What is going on? Am I have I gone mad? Have I gone mad? That's right. And our other business story today is Google Drive users are saying Google lost their files and Google is investigating. They're only investigating after they got enough feedback and they, they were actually scrubbing comments about this off of their forums until finally the thing, you know, strikes and out of, uh, out of um, uh, control. And so it turns out, I don't know why that thing is zoomed up so high. Uh, there we are. So it turns out that um, there's a problem with Google Drive that was actually completely destroying all of your files and reverting back to a previous year. This one guy, his files reverted back to the same state they were in in May of 2023. Some of them said last one or two years. Now, this has specifically to do with the drive for desktop versions 84000 to 84040 sync issues. Um, now, although some people said it's that they had the same issue without having the Google Drive for desktop installed. So some people are saying it's from Google Desktop. Some people are saying it's outside of there. So a few factors. The first is there are two ways that Google does these. One way is a mirror syncing and uh, the other one, uh, there's a specific name for it. Um, one of them is a mirror syncing and the other one is a, uh, okay, here, here's the paragraph where it explains it. So mirroring is not the default mirroring. It means it keeps a copy. The other one is, is a file stream. So mirroring is when you write a file, it's on your desktop and then a copy of that goes up to the cloud. And then every one of your clients that is synced to that instance it will always pull the newest version of that file. So you're constantly syncing that same version of the file across everything. The other method is the file stream where there is no actual link to the file. There is no actual file on your device. It is just a, uh, a shortcut that looks like the file that is not actually the file on your desktop. So if you're unclear whether or not you have that methodology, disconnect your device from the internet, try and access those files. If it can't access those files, you are on file stream, not on smearing. Mirroring is not the default. File syncing is the, or file stream is the default. And the problem appears to be with file stream, where something went wonky in Google's database, that if you had mirroring in effect, if you explicitly set to mirroring, you didn't have a problem. But if you happened to, um, if you happened to ha be using uh, file stream instead, that is what would cause a problem because that file on your computer is not the actual file you're working with. It's just a link to the one in the cloud. What I suspect has happened, not confirmed, this is just what I suspect has happened, is Google had a data loss at one of the data centers that uh, affected, you know, not everybody, just a, a small subset. You know, assume they have 5,000 servers to feed all of these files across the world and one of those 5,000 goes down, you know, then 
a certain number of people that were on that server would be impacted. And they're like, oh, crap, we don't have a, a backup for the last month. What's the last backup? Eh, six months ago. All right, roll that one back. That's how you get all your files revert back to May 2023. Same thing if you had a catastrophic data loss and you go to restore your files, everything you'd have was from the version that you last did a backup. And this is why you need to do a regular backup. So if you are using this nonsense, please switch to something like NextCloud and don't use Google. But if you are using this nonsense, please make sure that you have mirroring turned on. That way, a copy of the file rests across your devices. You make a change on that file, it gets synced to the cloud. But if there happens to be a cloud rollout, like I think happened here, then as soon as the cloud comes back on, it's just going to automatically sync with a newer version, which is the one on your device. So this is really only going to be a problem if you're using file stream as your default. Uh, but they're still looking into it. And they did actually tell people, if you are impacted, uh, do not disconnect the account. This is what they say. Don't disconnect the account. Don't delete or move the app data folder. Here's the location is on Windows and Mac. Sadly, they don't tell us where it is on Linux jerks and optional if you have room on your hard drive we recommend making a copy of the app data folder the idea here is they're going to try and figure out what the problem is and see if they can restore the current versions out of those cache files uh, so they don't want people tinkering around a whole lot until they know exactly what's going on so but that's yeah, exciting well, if you want to help support the channel, we do have a Digital Ocean affiliate, tlm.li forward slash doh. Of course, uh, we have a new Jitsi server that is now at Digital Ocean, moved from Linode just uh, this last week. And uh, I have a number of other things spinning up over there at DigitalOcean. You can do all sorts of things from your Jitsi servers, NextCloud servers. Uh, you can do a Jellyfin server, web servers, just all sorts of weird stuff that you might want to have on the Internet rather than on your own local network. So if you are interested in such a thing, tlm.li forward slash doh, that's going to give you... Uh, $200 of credit, good for 60 days. You can spin up a lot of stuff, see if it works for you. And at that point in time, uh, once you've actually spent $25, I will get a $25 credit towards my account. They don't actually pay me money, but account credit's pretty good, being as that I have production web servers over there. It cuts my budget back a little bit. So uh, you can help uh, support the channel over on DigitalOcean, tlm.li forward slash d. O-H. And with that, let's head on over to your favorite place and mine. Let's head on to Sillyville and see what's going on. Police search for a thief who stole a van loaded with 10,000 Krispy Kreme donuts, last seen driving into Chris Christie's campaign headquarters. But, hmm, too early? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, there was actually a meme about that somewhere, so I had to bring it up. Uh, but the search is underway. This was not America. Uh, this was Sydney, Australia. 10,000 donuts were in the van, so the driver stepped on inside of a gas station to uh, you know, either make a delivery or buy some gas, and somebody's like, Krispy Kreme donut truck, I'm taking that boy home! And so he jumps on in, and uh, it, was, it was a van, not unlike my van, I promise there's not 10,000 Krispy Kreme donuts back here with me. Mm. Uh, but there you have it. So uh, somebody stole 10,000 donuts. This is the van there. So uh, there you have it, guys. So you have to see, there it is. So, he's, so he was fueling up at the gas pump. Someone stole all 10,000 donuts. So police are on the search for the guy who stole 10,000 Krispy Kremes. Hmm. And uh, there was no, uh, there was no tech news, uh, silly tech news. But uh, San Franciscans reported that as soon as the uh, communist dictators left the city, the uh, the poo is back, and the needles are back, and the homeless encampments are back. So it was just a cleanup for that. But what else is back is Jack Sparrow, because on top of all of the other crazy crime going on in San Francisco, there are actual pirates in San Francisco Bay raiding vessels for their booty. <laughs> like, we have reached total peak insanity here, that now there is a pirate problem in San Francisco Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh why in the world was actual pirates in the bay not on my 2023 bingo card i should have known i uh, love the headline as i almost stole it it reads almost like the babylon b doesn't it? it really makes me wonder who's running this let's see if we can see what that headline is 
It really makes me wonder who's running the simulation. But yes, there are actual criminals now using boats to commit crimes on the San Francisco Bay. Oh, this is Zero Hedge. I don't usually do articles from Zero Hedge. Crime in San Francisco is so bad, there are actual pirates in the Bay. <laughs> this is confirmed by local media reports. So, here's what's going on. Past summer, a spree of robberies plagued the 800-foot-wide uh, Oakland Almadita estuary involving stolen motorboats that were used to prey on larger vessels in the marina. One instance, thieves made off with three inflatable dinghies from an Alamada yacht club. Burglars hit at least four other Bay Area yacht clubs, a sailor center, and several other uh, several owners living on their boats. Kind of like the boat version of me. Uh, this is why I avoid cities. Guy, if you're living on a boat, don't dock in a big city harbor. Go, like, anchor at some little place off to the middle. Anyway, uh, it's, just, it's just homeless people living on the boats. For some reason, nobody wants to deal with it. The Oakland police say it's Alamada's issue. Alamada says it's Oakland's side of the estuary. Authorities on, on why they're not enforcing law. The code is more what you'd call guidelines and actual rules. All right. Uh, seriously, though, what's going on in the Bay Area? They've got literal pirates in the Bay. It's like Saturday Night Live skit if Saturday Night Live were funny. Uh, so these people are just common criminals. They're living on illegal anchor off vessels committing robberies in the Bay. Uh, so the harbor master said in the anchor offs or anchor outs, the boats are illegally anchored without a permit. So outboard motor shop owner, this guy just had a bunch of stuff stolen, blah, blah, blah. And so, um, yeah, we got poop on the street, crime records, homeless stuff's off the chart, and now pilots. We have literal pirates in San Francisco. Oh, come on, man. That picture was the best one. Let's see if I can get that picture to load. There you go. Here's the Californians. Here's California going down, and here's the red states. <laughs> <laughs> So there we have it. Jack Sparrow is now visiting San Francisco. Um, so keep an eye on your uh, your rum and your other booties. Well, if you would like to help support the channel, we do have a locals page. Switch to linux.locals.com. You can jump on over there, help support the channel. Of course, this is, in my opinion, this is the best place uh, to get the um, uh, the new science fiction short stories because on Locals, I can set how far before you have to sign up. So you can actually go and read the first, usually the first um uh, the first chapter, or I think the last story was a shorter one, so I only did like the first half a chapter. But you can read the first half a chapter to decide if you'd like to uh, pay for the rest over there on Locals. Switch to linux.locals.com. I believe you will need an account to see it, but you don't have to pay to see that stuff there. Uh, just if you want to get the full article or download the audiobook for it. So over there, switch linux.locals.com. Well, thank you for watching this version of the news, and we will see you all next time. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.